All right. So uh, looking at the schedule, you've just turned in homework number seven, which was Bernoulli's equation, pitot tubes, rotational flow. Uh, next up is uh, homework number eight. And uh, homework eight and this part of the lecture is taking us now into chapter five in the textbook. And so I hope you're taking the time to read through and kind of get the second opinion that you can receive by uh, utilizing the textbook as well as the lectures and the printed notes that I've given you as a PDF file. Um, it's a great idea to to see what the textbook has to say on this material, but we're in chapter five now if you're following along. So that homework will be due on Tuesday and then uh, our midterm exam, we still have quite a bit of time until midterm exam number two. That's not until Tuesday the 17th of November. So any announcements related questions before we move on? All right. Now, this is an aerial photo of a, a dam. And you can see it down here at the lower right part of the screen, the Oahe Dam. And uh, this is a reservoir that straddles North and South Dakota. It's an artificial reservoir that was uh, made several years ago. And uh, it's a dam on the Missouri River. And it forms a very large artificial reservoir. You can see from the statistics here that it's 23 million acre feet. And that may not be an, uh, a unit of measurement that you've heard before or maybe reflected on. It's pretty simple. An area, of course, is a unit, excuse me, an acre is a unit of area. And so there are 43,560 square feet in an acre for some reason, uh, 43,560. But if you have one foot depth of water over an acre, then that would be an acre foot. And so what we're saying about this Oahe Dam is that the reservoir upstream of it is 23 million acre feet. And so there's really a huge volume of water behind that dam. And it was constructed and is operated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And the purpose of it is uh, multi, it's multi-purpose. The, the functionality of that dam partly is to generate electricity, and it's largely to help regulate the flow of the Missouri River. And so regulating the flow of the river provides benefits related to um, flood protection, and it also increases the navigability of the river, meaning that uh, traffic, barge traffic, is able to go up and down the river more easily if the water level is at a, kind of a more constant depth. You know, without that regulation, then during some of the uh, uh, off season, the water depth would be very low and it would be hard for some deeply laden vessels to get up and down the river. Um, and then in flood times, when the water level is high, you don't have so much a problem about vessels not having adequate draft. But then the problem is, is if the water level is really high, then it may be a struggle to get under certain bridges. Because if the water level is very close to the under deck of a bridge, then a barge maybe would be scraping up against that. So you know, flood control is more, more than just protecting the, the land on either side of a river, but it's also about um, the kind of second order effects, like the transportation and um, other uses for the water, like agricultural and cooling uses associated with electricity generation. So, you know, dams provide a lot of benefit. Now, the reason I show you about this Oahe Dam, and now we're zooming in here, zooming in more closely on the dam portion. Um, is we're going to be talking about the control volume approach and the continuity equation. And this is something, a concept that I've already previously introduced for those of you who are taking the, um, the lab class. We talked about the control volume when we were discussing uh, Bernoulli's equation. Um, but here in this dam, what we'd like to kind of focus in on is how does the water go into the reservoir and how does the water come out of the reservoir? And you can see that the water comes out of the reservoir in a couple of different places. Uh, on the right side, just on the downstream end of the dam here, is where most of the time water is going to be flowing through the power plant. 
uh, to generate electricity. There's a certain volume of water that can be taken through this intake structure and go down through the turbines and the pipe that connects the intake to the turbines is called a penstock. And so the water that's flowing through there spins the turbine and they can generate electricity. Um, on the left side of the dam is a spillway or an outlet structure that's only used when there's really a lot of water coming into the dam and when the water levels behind the dam are high then there's too much and you can't put all of the water through the power plant so then they have to open up the secondary outlet structure. So these release gates aren't open very often and when they are open it's kind of uh, an event. It's something that uh, is important and meaningful and so we're going to take a look at some video of what it looks like when the water's flowing through those release gates. So here is a photo of the power plant and this is out in a relatively flat area. You know we're talking about North Dakota and South Dakota and so this isn't Colorado or Utah or any kind of a mountainous area by any stretch of the imagination. You know there's a dam there and there is some uh, elevation difference between the water coming out of the dam and the river elevation and then the water surface elevation in the reservoir but we're not talking about hundreds of feet like we maybe would if we were talking about a western dam. This is a much lower elevation difference and so because of that relatively minor elevation difference that limits the amount of electricity that can be generated but still it is economically viable. Just as a, uh, a taste of how the continuity equation works. Uh, let's consider this example of what happened back in 2011 during a period of some heavy rainstorms. But before we crunch the numbers on that, let's take a look at a couple of these videos just as an illustration to give you a sense for how big this uh, discharge actually was through the auxiliary spillway. Just wait for a moment for it to load and I'll bring it up on the screen here. Of turbulence. Um, a key indicator that you've got a really high velocity of water is the fact that you can see white caps as these jets of water goes into the river that's downstream. And so we're now looking downstream and so over to the left side is where the water that's going through the power plant rejoins the river and so then what we're looking at right here is the uh, location, let me just bring back up the power plant. Uh, we're looking at the river from this perspective, from over here and so to the left is water that has come out of the power plant. And so there's just a tremendous amount of energy that's being dissipated as a super ultra high velocity jet of water is entering this river. And part of the interesting uh, challenge that an engineer is going to face when they are designing a structure like this is how to dissipate the energy of those water jets without causing scour of the river downstream. And so um, in CE331 in hydraulic engineering, what we'll talk about is a hydraulic jumps and a strategy for dissipating the energy coming out of a structure like this by forcing kind of a unique phenomenon called the hydraulic jump. Um, I think we've got, yeah, here is a uh, another angle that's just showing you the amount of energy that's being dissipated into the stream there is pretty incredible. So let me skip ahead and we'll take a look at a couple of different views. Normally you wouldn't see rolling white caps like this on a relatively flat river like the Missouri, but it's just the effect of the pressure on the upstream side of the dam that's causing all of that turbulence. So this was back in 2011. It's been a while since there was high enough rainstorms in the watershed that feeds into this but it was an event. Okay, so you get the point. That was a lot of water. Now let's consider the example. So what this example is saying is that during this period, 
I just noticed a uh, comment there. Uh, what happens when it freezes? When the, uh, when the water freezes? Um, the Missouri River does freeze in really cold weather, but I think that the water is moving fast enough in and around the inlet and the outlet structure that it doesn't freeze up at the dam itself. The spots that I've seen, I used to live in Kansas City, which is right on the uh, Missouri River, and uh, the couple of times that we saw the river freezing, it wasn't like a top to bottom freeze. It was more just that there were patches of ice along the top and the water continued to flow underneath the surface. So I think that the uh, super cold temperatures isn't going to affect the functionality of the dam because there would just be a layer of frozen water on top and then the inlet structure is below that surface. And same with the outlet. All right, so let's consider the flow rates here. Um, 160,000 cubic feet per second had to be discharged from the Oahe Dam. And the distribution of that is that a maximum of 50,000 CFS is discharged through the power plant. That's the upper limit of what they can accommodate through the power plant. And so that means that what we were just seeing out of the uh, spillway release gates was 110,000 CFS. And so that stands for cubic feet per second. And so, I mean, you can just kind of visualize what a cubic feet would be, a, a cubic foot would be, one foot cubed. And so in every second, 110,000 cubic feet of water was being discharged through the six gates. And so there are six gates in total. And the statistics that I found online was that the, uh, the diameter of each of those gates is 19 feet. So pretty large diameter that jet that's going out 19 foot in diameter. It maybe didn't look that large from the video, but we really didn't have any, uh, any kind of perspective. There wasn't anybody standing next to that jet of water to give us a sense for how big it was. All right, so the, um, the continuity equation, which we've talked about a couple of times in the lab, but what I'll address right now is that Q equals VA. So there in your notes, if you've got these printed out, the formula that we're going to use to find out what was the water velocity through the gates is that the flow rate, Q, is equal to the velocity of the water, V, multiplied by the cross-sectional area. And so let me pause for a second and see if you can find what's the velocity through the gates with Q equals VA, and then of course the cross-sectional area of a circular jet is pi d squared divided by 4. And so you're going to need to take this given diameter and convert it into a cross-sectional area. So we want to find out through the gates what was the average water velocity. So let me pause for a second and see if, if you can figure that out. Of course, type your guess into the chat box and then in a moment I'll bring up uh, my solution of the PDF and just uh, put it on the screen. All right, so it's 160,000 CFS that goes through the dam, 50,000 of that through the power plant, and so that means what's left over is 110,000 CFS through the spillways. And that means each of the spillways is going to carry 18,333 cubic feet per second. And now that's the Q. We want to find V. And so if Q equals VA, then V, the flow velocity, is the flow rate divided by the area. And if you forget that formula, you can just look at the units. And we know that velocity is going to be units of length per time, meaning here in traditional units, feet per second. So the way that you'd get feet per second is by dividing cubic feet per second by square feet. And so that would leave you with feet per second. So we need to know the cross-sectional area. And if we know the diameter of the gate is 19 feet, then you can find the cross-sectional area, and that's just of a single gate because we found the flow rate through each spillway. So that's just one-sixth of the total spillway flow. So you can see that in the end the velocity is going to be 64.7 CFS 
cubic feet, uh, ex excuse me, uh, feet per second, not CFS, feet per second. And that's a really high velocity, um, kind of an upper limit for the velocity that we'd like to see over a normal concrete surface would be 10 feet per second if it's going to be continual flow, like flow through a concrete sewer pipe, we'd want the velocity to be less than 10 feet per second because any more than that and the water is going to be exerting some scour energy that over the long term could cause erosion and, um, and if there's erosion then there could be cavitation. And I think we've just briefly talked about cavitation in the past and we'll circle back to that later, but it's essentially a process where um, very small bubbles of water vapor can form and then collapse, sending a shock wave through the water and causing pitting and damage to the materials that are in the area. So if you are going to have a specialized case like these overflow spillways that only have water going occasionally, that's one thing that it is going for it, is that you wouldn't see flow 365 days a year through that overspill, overflow spillway. It may be the sort of thing that it's only going to uh, happen you know, for a week every couple of years. But uh, the other aspect of it is that they really would put in some specialized uh, reinforcing steel. They'd make sure that it's finished very smooth and uh, put some special cladding on the outside. And so a pretty careful attention would be given to a situation where you've got that much water going through the gates. And by the way, just to put this in perspective, 160,000 CFS, um, I think that I've got this link to the current conditions of the Ohio River here in Huntington. And so let's see if that's the case, what that link is. Oh, no, I remember what that is. It's pulling up in the other window just at one moment. Okay. So, um, Many of you have been probably whitewater rafting before. Here in West Virginia, there's lots of uh, great opportunities for white, whitewater rafting. And uh, the Gauley River is kind of world renowned for being really good whitewater rafting. And just to give you an idea, to put it in perspective, how big 110,000 CFS is, um, when they are discharging water to the Gauley River, then the, uh, the flow rates that they're aiming for, you can see 2,800 CFS. And so that's during the season that people are kind of doing whitewater rafting, and it seems like a lot of water. But uh, 2,800 CFS seems, you know, like a lot when you're there on it in a rubber boat, but then uh, it doesn't seem like quite as much when you think about uh -huh, 110,000 CFS going through those spillways. So it kind of helps to put things in perspective. All right, now here is another look at the uh, water coming out of those spillways. And you can see uh, just a tremendous amount of energy. Oh, and here we do have a person for perspective to give you an idea about how big things are there. It almost seems dangerous, you know, looking at it from the side like that. I wonder if someone was to jump in, you know, like even if they were wearing, <laughs> if you were wearing a life jacket, what would happen just from jumping in there? It'd be an exciting afternoon at the very least. All right. So that's the Oahe. Now the uh, continuity equation, which is what we're learning about here in chapter five, is that volumetric flow rate can be determined by multiplying the average cross-sectional velocity by the cross-sectional area. And so here V bar, what we're talking about with the, the bar across the top, that's meant to indicate the average velocity. And uh, normally, the flow conditions are going to vary as a function of how far away you are from the pipe wall. And remember, uh, earlier in the semester, we've talked about the no-slip condition. And we looked at a uh, video where some greenish dye was being injected at the bottom 
of a flow channel where the water was flowing kind of like a stream or a river. The water was flowing from one side to the other. And just to make the point that down at the bottom of the river, the water velocity is zero, they injected some of the dye there and it stayed at the bottom until a little spoon was used to kind of swish back and forth and disturb that tracer dye and then it finally uh, moved downstream. So at the edge of a stationary material like a pipe or the bottom of a river, the velocity is zero. And the velocity is fastest at the middle of the pipe where you're the furthest away from those locations where the shear stress is applied. And so if we take the average across the cross section, then V bar is what we'd get from that. And so the volumetric flow rate is that average cross-sectional velocity multiplied by the area. Now, if we take into account the density of the fluid, then <coughs> excuse me, uh, the mass flow rate indicated here with an m dot is going to have units of kilograms per second. So instead of talking about the volumetric flow in cubic meters per second, if you multiply Q, the volumetric flow rate, by the density, then what you'll have is kilograms per second. And so that's the mass flow rate. And this mass flow rate, m dot, is going to be really important when we get into chapter 6 and start talking about momentum flows in a system. Because uh, the momentum flow, the mass flow rate per time, is going to be the way that we calculate what force is required to hold a system steady when a fluid is changing direction. So in other words, the mass flow rate is just the volumetric flow rate multiplied by density. Now this is showing the bullet-shaped velocity distribution that we would expect to see if conditions were laminar. And you've seen a velocity profile before, this parabolic or bullet-shaped velocity distribution where the velocity in the pipe is the fastest at the center and goes down to zero at the edge of the pipe wall. And so if we kind of integrated that varying velocity profile over the differential area of the entire uh, cross-section, then we could find the volumetric flow by looking at the specific flow rate at each of these small elements. And the distribution is essentially uh, an outgrowth of pipe friction and the shear stress that is applied by the pipe to the water when the water is moving um, through the pipe. And so if we're not thinking in terms of average flow rates, but we're thinking about the flow rate, or excuse me, the velocity at an individual location, then we would integrate over a differential area and find the, the volumetric, flow, volumetric flow rate that way. But most of the time, the mean or average velocity uh, is accurate enough for determining things like uh, the amount of water delivered by a pipe in a certain period of time. And that's a big part of what we're doing in engineering is just calculating the quantities and the required diameter of a pipe for a certain uh, application where we're moving water from, say, a, a a drinking water treatment plant up to a storage tank or something like that. So mean velocity would be fine in an application like that. And so if you have laminar conditions and that parabolic velocity profile, then at the center line, the velocity is twice the average velocity for the entire cross section. Um, now when we have turbulent flow conditions, then there's going to be a lot of variation in the velocity at any particular location of the cross-section. And it's also going to be changing over time as well. So uh, in general, the average velocity may be constant over time. But at a, at a single location, the velocity may be a little bit faster at one moment and a little bit slower at the next. But the uh, the average velocity and the centerline velocity are relatively close to each other in the case of turbulent flow. All right, so just to get a taste for how to uh, deal with mass flow rate, let's consider that we have oil flowing through a pipe of a known diameter. Here we know that the diameter of the pipe is 50 centimeters. And then the mass flow rate, m dot, is 550 kilograms per second. So with that, 
I'd like you to calculate the uh, mean velocity and also the volumetric flow rate for this flow situation where we have oil with a known density flowing through the pipe. So in other words, calculate m dot. Oh no, you have m dot. Calculate q, and then once you have q, calculate v bar. So sometimes we have to be careful about the units because the diameter of this pipe was given in centimeters. And if you are in the habit of writing down the units every time you start calculations, then you're not going to fall into the same traps that you otherwise might if you just write down the number. So, you know, for example, you're going to need the cross-sectional area on this problem. So A is pi D squared divided by 4. And if you just write that D is 50, then you're going to have the cross-sectional area in units of centimeter squared, and that's not what you need. So just one point I'll make up front is, you know, if you are in the habit of writing down the units with the numbers, then you're less likely that you're going to make mistakes later on. So for instance, here in calculating the uh, cross-sectional area, 0.19635 meters squared, uh, that's the units that we'll need later on to calculate the velocity. Uh, but first, Q, the volumetric flow rate, is simply going to be the mass flow rate divided by the density. So you can see that the volumetric flow rate is 0.6471 cubic meters per second. And now to find the mean velocity from that, if Q equals VA, then V is Q divided by A. And so we've got the volumetric flow rate and the cross-sectional area. And uh, I'll round off at the end, but until then, I'm leaving all of the precision and digits in my calculator that, I've, that I can. And so you know I'm displaying four digits here, but there's more of them in the background of the calculator. Uh, it should be 3.3 meters per second is the average velocity. So that will be when the oil is flowing through that pipe at 550 kilograms per second, we can find the equivalent volumetric flow rate and also the flow velocity. So this entire chapter five is just kind of applications of Q equals VA. A variety of applications of really what is at its core a pretty simple principle. Now, uh, the control volume approach is a way to analyze problems according to flow in and flow out through a control surface and accumulation of mass inside of a control volume. So this image, which comes from our textbook, is a look at a pipe where maybe the flow direction is changing and also the diameter of the pipe is shifting. Just by inspection we can see here at location 2 it seems that the diameter of the pipe is smaller than the diameter of the pipe was at location 1. So the velocity would be relatively slower at 1 compared to the velocity at 2 because if the diameter is getting smaller then that means for the same flow rate to go in as is going out the velocity would have to be faster at 2. But really, the heart of this control volume approach is just what we're going to do is we're going to set a boundary. And so this dashed line is the boundary of the control surface. And so on the inside of the control surface is the control volume. And it's a space where we're going to be tracking what goes in and what goes out inside of that space. Now, the system are the fluid particles that we're interested in. And the mass of the system is constant because uh, the system itself doesn't change. It's just the location of the system may be adjusting over time. But the, uh, the particles aren't necessarily being destroyed or created. It's just that the location of the particles change during this period of analysis. 
They're going to be flowing through the control surfaces and entering the control volume. Now the control volume, uh, it can change its location, its shape can adjust over time, it can rotate, and so just because it's a location that we're going to be tracking the flow in and the flow out of, that doesn't mean that it has to stay in the, stay in the same pl uh, place. The control volume over time can be transient. And the control surfaces are the outer edge of the control volume. So what our approach is going to be to apply the control volume principle is just by looking at, as an illustration, a tank of water. So this is a tank and um, there is flow into the tank through a feeding pipe and then there's flow out of the tank through a discharge pipe. And this right now, uh, we're going to call this an instant of time. This is just a, a picture that's capturing at time t where is the system. And we're going to call the system the darker blue liquid. And so the light blue liquid is also water, but it's not, it's not a part of the system that we're tracking. We're just, there's a certain amount of water that we're considering the system that we're going to analyze during an interval of time. And so right now, there's a certain amount of this system that's in the control volume. And so here you can see M subscript CV. That means the mass of the system in the control volume at time T. Some of the system is also in this inlet pipe. And so this is just at this instant of time, a certain amount of that water is in the inlet pipe. And then you can see the dashed lines represent the control surfaces, the inside of which is the control volume. So this is at time t. And then a little while later, the system still is the same amount of water, but its location has changed. Since there was water flowing into the tank and also water flowing out of the tank, what happened was that portion of the system that was in the feeder pipe is now inside of the tank and also mixed with that portion of the system that's in the outflow pipe as well. Now if you look really carefully, it's subtle, but if you look carefully you can see that the water level on the right is lower than the water level on the left. Okay, so this is where control volume analysis starts to get important. What does that tell us about the relative flow rate of in versus out if the water level is lower? So there's Q in and there's Q out. There's water coming into the tank and water going out of the tank. Which is higher? Is the flow rate in higher or is the flow rate out higher? Just by looking at the liquid level and what happened. So we've got several people saying the flow out is higher, and they're right. And the reason why they know that is because if out is greater than in, then there's going to be a depletion of water that's inside of the control volume. And so we're looking at storage, essentially. This tank is a location where uh, water can accumulate or where that previous accumulation can be discharged or can be reduced by looking at the difference between in and out. So you can think of sort of like this is like a savings account. You know, you look at the difference between in and out, and if you have more outflow than inflow, then your balance is going to be declining. So that's the case here, is that there's more outflow than inflow. And so the volume of water that's stored inside of the tank is lower at time t plus delta t. So the two options for water that comes in, it can either exit or be stored. And the system, meaning those continuously connected volume uh, of particles of water, it doesn't change, but the locations may shift over time. There can also be mixing, uh, but for now we're going to assume that this is kind of plug flow through the inlet and the outlet pipes that the water uh, isn't going to be diffusively mixing inside the inlet pipe, for example. All right, so now let's think about where is the water at different times. At time t, the water is partly inside of the control volume, 
the water that is our system, and some of it is in the inflow pipe. So the mass of the system at time t is in those two locations. And then later, at time t plus delta t, then some of it's in the control volume and some of it is in the outflow pipe. And so what we can say is that the change in storage volume is the difference between the in and the out. So here, there was a mass flow rate that was net negative, meaning that our storage volume was going to be decreasing over time. And so the change of mass inside the control volume during this interval of time was the difference between the mass flow rate in and the mass flow rate out. And this is an important principle. When uh, you get into environmental engineering, some of you will. Unfortunately, not everyone will take that class. But um, it seems like a simple idea, but mass balance is the starting point for really a lot of problems having to do with environmental pollution and contamination, remediation, trying to get uh, you know, impure constituents out of soil and water and air. We have to look at how the mass is flowing in and out of a control volume. And so this simple principle that you're beginning to get here in fluid mechanics has lots of applications down the road having to do with keeping track of where pollutants are. Um, now it's not just mass that may be flowing through control surfaces, it may be the properties associated with that mass. And so extensive properties are those that are related to the amount of um, mass in the system. So when you think about water flowing through a tank, for example, the amount of energy that is tied up in that water also flows through the control surfaces, as does the momentum. So momentum is proportional to the mass of the system. And so if you have a lot of water and it's moving at a high velocity, then there's going to be a lot of momentum that also is entering and going out of the control surface. But those are the extensive properties. There are some properties that are independent of how much mass you have in the system. So for example, the fluid properties like viscosity or the color of the water, uh, those are both intensive properties, which means it doesn't matter if you have a little bit or a lot of water, its color isn't changed by the quantity that you have. And so certain intensive uh, properties um, we don't have to keep track of how the amount of that property um, is translated when it goes through the control surface. But in the case of extensive properties, those properties are transported with the fluid. All right, so um, let's look at the Oahe Dam in some greater detail. Um, it's got an area of 370,000 acres and an average depth of 63.5 feet. And I've already told you that back in June 2011, they had a pretty wet month. Uh, they were having to release 160,000 CFS through the dam. So what I'd like you to try and estimate, or calculate rather, is how many days would it take to drain the lake if the water that's flowing into the lake what we know is the width and the depth of the river and also the velocity. So, you know, the lake has some water coming in and some water going out. And so we're going to neglect the effect of evaporation. So that would be one way that you lose water through a reservoir and a dam is, you know, some of it's going to be lost into the atmosphere through evaporation. But let's neglect evaporation. Let's also neglect um, Let's also neglect uh, seepage of water down into the ground. But let's just look at the flow coming in through this inlet river that's 40 feet wide, 8.5 feet deep, and a velocity of 3.5 feet per second. And then um, there's also water coming into the reservoir uh, that is releasing 13 million pounds of water per minute. So there's the two places that water is coming in. And the one place that it's going out is through the dam itself. And we know that it's 160,000 CFS going out of the dam. And so, um, man, I wish it was easier for me to sketch here, but I'll set up a sketch here with this to make my point. 
for mass balance, what we're going to have is this is the reservoir. And there is one stream of water coming in through the river and another that's coming from an upstream dam. And then there is 160,000 CFS that's coming out. So let's say this is Q out is 160,000 CFS. All right, and then this stream is the one that is the river, and it is, uh, well, yeah, you see the characteristics here. 40 feet wide, 8.5 feet deep, and a velocity of 3.5 feet per second. So the river is going to be putting some water in, and then there's also this upstream dam. And it's releasing a certain amount of water into Oahe. And what we want to find out is how long until the water level is down to zero. How long until the reservoir is empty if you compare the difference between the in and the out. So I think one thing that you may uh, end up calculating is the velocity that the water level is falling. That would be one way to handle it or just the, the net time to drain is if you're looking at the difference in the volumetric flow rate, the in versus the out, how long until you use up all of the water that's inside of that, uh, in that reservoir. All right, so I suggest here that you can search online for any needed conversions, but let me type a couple of conversions that I think you may end up needing. And so, for instance, one of the conversions that you maybe could possibly use is uh, one acre is 43,560 feet squared. So that's one of the unit conversions that you can do. And then also the uh, water density is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. All right, let me pause for a second and uh, remember what you're going to be using here is the difference between in and out. So we want to find what's the net difference between in and out and how long is it going to take to drain this big tank. You can think of the, the reservoir as a large tank that's holding a lot of water. The, the top area of the reservoir is 370,000 acres and the average depth 60. 3.5. That's how you can find the volume of the lake. All right, I'm going to pause for a second and give you a moment to start calculating these, uh, these quantities. Okay, so in the chat box area there, we have uh, identified most of the component intermediate steps for solving this question. So uh, let me pull it up now, look at it together. All right. So we've got this lake that's like a tank of water. And we want to find out how quickly, or rather how long it's going to take until it's drained down to empty. Because there's more going out than is coming in, as we'll, look, as we'll find in just a moment. So uh, the first thing that I calculated here was the uh, average cross-sectional area. So that's like the top view of the um, of the reservoir and we're kind of simplifying things here because what we're assuming is that it has straight walls and that the area is the same as the depth decreases but more realistically what happens is the deeper a reservoir becomes the larger its area is and so when we're doing kind of a more genuine and uh, realistic hydrologic analysis of a reservoir we would have a curve that tells us for a certain depth what is the area at that depth. And so the, the volume curve for a reservoir isn't going to be linear like we're assuming here just for this kind of simple first uh, crack at the continuity equation. But um, we, we have this cross-sectional area. And then we know that the flow rate out that's being discharged through the 
combined dam and spillway is 160,000. And then the uh, flow that's coming in through the river, the river we knew its width and its depth. And so you can find the cross-sectional area of the river by multiplying the river's width and the depth together. So that gives you the area of the river. And then we also knew that the average velocity was 3.5 feet per second. And so from those two things together, that enables us to calculate that the flow rate that's coming into the reservoir by the river is 1190 CFS. So that's very little compared to the flow out. You know, from that river that's coming in, it's only essentially 1,190 compared to 160,000. And then the other way that water is coming in is this dam where, for some reason, we had the mass flow rate, 13 million pounds of water per minute. So we need to put that into the same units to be able to compare it to the volumetric in, the volumetric out that we already have. So if we divide that mass flow rate by the density, so pounds per minute divided by pounds per cubic foot. And so the pounds will cancel out. And then the per cubic foot, which is in the denominator of the denominator, that jumps up into the numerator. So now that's 208,000 cubic feet per minute. And then dividing by 60 seconds per minute tells us that that's only 3,472 CFS. So this is a big reservoir that's mostly emptying. 160,000 out, and then looks like less than a combined inflow of 5,000. So that being the case, how long is it going to take for this water level to fall all the way down to zero? So we have to look at the net accumulation. Our net accumulation is negative because there is very little in to this reservoir compared to the large quantity flowing out of the reservoir. So the net accumulation is negative, which means the water level is falling. Now, incidentally, if you wanted to know the velocity that the water level is falling, we have enough data to do that because we have the area of the reservoir and this net accumulation. So if you wanted to find out like how many feet per second is the water level falling, then you could divide this net accumulation by the area. And I guess just because I've mentioned it, I guess maybe I ought to do it now. So I'm going to get my calculator going here. So 155,338 divided by 1.611 times 10 to the so I got to find that function on the calculator here uh, times 10 to the tenth. All right. So you divide that. And so the water level is falling at a rate of 9.6 times 10 to the minus sixth feet per second. That's really slowly. If you drive like a stick in the ground and come back hours later, you may have just the smallest perceivable drop in the water level, but the water level is drawing, uh, dropping very slowly just because this is such a large reservoir. All right, now the volume of the reservoir we get by its average depth and the area. So here's the overall volume of the reservoir, 1 times 10 to the 12th cubic feet. And then the, uh, the time to drain. It's the volume divided by the net outflow. So 6.6 .6 times 10 to the 6th seconds, which now if we divide by 86,400 seconds per day, and that tells us it's going to be 76.3 days. So that's with it emptying full blast and a very little flow coming in. So it could take even longer to empty if, uh, if you're only discharging, for example, through the, um, through the power plant, or if it rains in the upstream area and now suddenly there's more flow coming in than this kind of minimal flow rate that we've talked about. It's a very large reservoir. 
All right, so that's just your first taste of the continuity equation in Chapter 5, the control volume approach. Any questions about this example before we conclude for today? No? All right, so your next homework assignment, um, homework assignment number 8. I'm going to load that onto Blackboard. I don't think it's there yet, but I'll load it onto Blackboard immediately after this class finishes, and then you can get an early start on that. Uh, that's it for today. I'll see you in the lab or not on Thursday. Take care, everybody.